And I was really interested in the idea that, you know, you both have experience in it. And I feel like it used to be this thing that you played in your basement and you didn't tell anyone about right. it because you would get bullied. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, because we have Stranger Things, it's like yeah. a central role in that. That's the biggest show on Netflix. Did it feel like you had to wait kind of until this point, until D&D &D has become so popular to be able to make a movie like this? Mm. Well, we didn't have to wait. Uh, I think just culturally, it, it tended to sort of lean toward the idea of this this movie working. Um, but as you said, you know, nerd culture, I think the thing that makes it so special and unique is that it is basically just the forefront of culture. It's it's the, the, the next stage of things that become uh, overwhelmingly popular with the masses. And so it felt like a natural kind of evolution of where things were headed. And I'm so glad that people are finally understanding what's so special and unique about it. I also think because there's been a sort of preponderance of fantasy um, shows and movies recently, it laid the groundwork for us to explode the conventions of it a bit. Not spoof it, but have people familiar enough with those conventions that they know what we're doing when we undermine them. Yeah, it's so interesting you say that because fantasy obviously is having such a huge moment in TV, mm -hmm. but it feels like in film, like obviously you have experience in Marvel, you know, comic book movies are really shaping how we tell stories at the moment on the big screen. And this to me felt like a real throwback to like Princess Bride yeah. and Willow and all that stuff. Yeah. Did you have conversations about like, right, how do we adapt this model so that it fits into what cinema is now? Um, you know, I don't think it was a, conscience, a conscious decision to do that. I think we knew we had to, to make a film that would appeal to a broad audience and not just fans of the, the genre or of specifically D&D. &D. Uh, but generally speaking, we enjoy subverting people's expectations um, with any genre. Uh, and we knew that D&D &D was a natural way into exploring the humor and uh, tone that makes it so special and makes it stand out from what you normally see in the fantasy space. So it just felt kind of like a, a natural progression. I, I also think that the Marvel film success has opened the door to studios being okay with the notion that you can have both big expensive action sequences and laughs in one movie. Um, that, that's a relatively new thing. I mean, Spielberg did it effectively with Raiders and movies like that, but I think studios are a little nervous about combining genres. They want a, uh, a serious medieval movie, not a, a one that makes you laugh. And I think Marvel did kind of pave the way for us to be able to do this I would in the D&D world. Yeah, I would say, though, that Marvel has become uh, so popular that it... I, I don't think that people see it necessarily as subversive uh, now because it is so... The norm now. Yeah, it is the norm. So it was also a challenge for us to think, okay, well, what do, what do we do to set ourselves apart from that as well? And that was kind of what prompted our exploration into the, the practical elements of the filmmaking, using more practical uh, locations and sets, because to us, that's what's so fun about it. it. And it harkens back to the adventure films, like you said, that we love from the 80s and 90s, Never Ending Story, Willow, but also those big Spielbergian blockbusters like Jurassic Park and Indiana Jones. I mean, you mentioned the practical effects, which I, I loved, and I loved the little cat baby. <laughs> What's it like directing puppets? I know that sounds like a weird yeah, question, but I'm amazing. really curious. Yeah, it's a whole different level because you have puppeteers who have to be within range of those things, either physically with rods or you know RC controllers. Sometimes we would have to have the puppeteers with the controllers in costume because they'd be in the shot. Um, for example, that giant fish that eats the, the baby tabaxi. Um, but it's, it introduces an element of unpredictability because it's, it's not like uh, CG where you're doing most of it after you've shot it. Um, but it also is exciting. You yeah. really feel like you're old time filmmaking because it's all right there. And that unpredictability, I think, is more akin to directing actors than it is to uh, creating something entirely in post because you don't 
quite know what's going to happen in the next take. And to me, that's what's so beautiful about it. But we also were able to employ state-of-the-art technology. There's this stigma that practical effects are old-fashioned, but we were using motion capture technology with puppeteers literally doing the facial movements that would then translate to the servos in the face of our dragonborn creatures. So you couldn't have done that 15, 20 years ago. Um, so it was this fun blend of technologies of the old and the new in a nice little fusion. And the really um, interesting thing about D&D is, like, I mean, it's basically an improv storytelling game. And I feel like in my experience of it, the tone has shifted so dramatically depending on like who I've been playing mm -hmm. with. And so when, you, you, when you're coming just like cementing the tone, what this movie is going to be like, how did you kind of incorporate the idea that it's going to be different to different people depending yes. on their experiences? Well, I think that that was the ultimate challenge of this in terms of the writing was to create the illusion of spontaneity in a movie that we've crafted down to the moment. It has no real spontaneity except sometimes actors would, would come up with something. But um, we wanted to make sure if we captured the spirit of play, then we knew that those who know the game would respond. Maybe it's not exactly like their dungeon master would do it, but we saw ourselves as the dungeon masters of the film, really, and yeah. it was up to us to sort of create the, uh, the the vibe of play. That's right. The the challenge is how do you adapt something that doesn't have any set story? And what we were really adapting was the spirit of the game, and I think anyone who's played kind of understands that when they see. And we also had a lot of different characters that allowed us to explore different methods of gameplay and different kind of personalities that are representative of the players. So it really is a salad of uh, different tones and personalities all in mixed into this kind of cohesive salad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can I say salad twice in the same sentence? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's good a salad metaphor, bar, so. and you make your own 